Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Now, this talk, um, I, it was originally called in Comparative Perspectives, and um, one part of the, what I'm writing on is really looking at the influenza in the U.S., Canada, France, uh, Germany to a certain extent, and uh, Australia, and in, and in India. Uh, but I haven't really finished that part yet, and so the comparative perspective has to do really with influenza uh, and other other epidemics, other epidemic diseases. And for that reason, this talk, I'm afraid, has a rather long driveway, but I will get to influenza. I'd like to begin by reading, because there's a lot of, of, of quotations in this passage, this introduction that gets at the, uh, the dominant uh, hypotheses, and then you can see sort of where I'm, I'm going. <clears throat> Epidemics are portrayed as hotbeds of the emotions, sparking the sudden rise of compassion, fear, violence, and hate. Over the past 60 years or more, historians have seized on the last three of these characteristics seeing disease across time and space as stigmatizing the other, often leading to violent recriminations. As René Bacquerel held in his classic article of Les Annales in 1952, such reactions are a part of our structure mentale constant psychologique. I guess in the common parlance it is to say, oh, it's part of our DNA, but I'm getting sick and tired of that that uh, analogy. Uh, with the eruption of HIV AIDS in the, in the 1980s, these conclusions gained force from scholars across disciplines. According to Carlo Ginzburg, the prodigious trauma of great pestilences intensified the search for a scapegoat on which fears, hatreds, and tension could be discharged. By the reckoning of Dorothy Nelkin and Sandra Gilman, Blaming has always been a means to make mysterious and devastating diseases comprehensible. Roy Porter concurred with Susan Sontag. Deadly diseases, especially when there is no cure at hand uh, and the etiology is obscure, spawn sinister connotations. And most recently, from earthquake-wrecked, cholera-hit Haiti, Paul Farmer has proclaimed, Blame was, after all, a calling card of all transnational epidemics. Scholars post-1980, moreover, have introduced at least implicitly a historical dynamic to this supposed universal fact of collective psychology. <clears throat> when the causes and cures of epidemic uh, diseases are unknown, hatred of the other becomes more likely, more pronounced. By this model, the diseases should have then become progressively more comprehensible with the decline of magic of the 16th century, the scientific revolution of the 17th, the enlightenment of the 18th, and especially the laboratory revolution of the 19th century. Conversely, scapegoating and blame should have been more prevalent before early modernity. The AIDS uh, experience adds a third ingredient to this cultural psychological frame. Sexual transmission of disease was especially explosive in propelling hate and suspicion of the other. These three elements, the newness, mysteriousness, and sexual character of a disease, come together uh, with, with syphilis appearance at the, in, at the end of the 15th century. Um, but um, <clears throat> And, and they've read the various names contemporaries gave to it as clear evidence of blame and the, and the, and the search for scapegoats. The, well, this talk challenges all of these conclusions. Um, first of all, and here's where the digression starts, 
uh, and where I spend quite a bit of time because it's my historical specialty, is and the the, the the disease is really before the 16th century, and there you have uh, with Livy we have 40, uh, 54 epidemics. Of course, we don't know what they are, and from his descriptions, I think it's foolish even to try and guess what they are. Uh, and then I've collected a database of almost 2,000 epidemics in history before 1600. And with this, it is very difficult to spot any diseases, and there are a few big exceptions like uh, leprosy in 1321 and the Black Death, even more importantly, but it's very difficult to spot any diseases that lead to any scapegoating of the other, any blaming of the other, and certainly any collective violence. In Livy, we don't find any of them. And instead, what happens with, in, in antiquity and throughout the Middle Ages uh, is that diseases tend to bring uh, societies together. They do just the opposite. And there are these wonderful descriptions, uh, again, in Livy, but in other classical scholars. So you get, a, for instance, this horrible ec epidemic of 402 BC which dumbfounded the medical profession. They knew no cures, and they turned to the oracles. And then what happens? Uh, it tells them that what they should do is to come together, get, make peace, uh, free their prisoners, and they open up their houses, the palaces of the senatorial classes, to the plebs and feed them. And what I really like is the touch, the matrons, the, the, the grand dames of the, of the uh, Roman aristocracy come into the temples and they wash the floors with their hair. And it's this type of coming together. There's a peace. People uh, are freed from work for a holiday for seven days uh, and, uh, and, and this society comes together. And what you find time and time again is that with wars and with other civil strife going on, particularly between the plebs and the senatorial cl classes, when a bad epidemic comes, it's just the opposite. This is a moment for peace. And in the Middle Ages, you find this uh, too. Okay, there is the Black Death. Some people have called me a denier of the Black Death. I won't deny uh, that the Black Death didn't cause not only these pogroms against the Jews across the Rhineland into Germany, into Spain, uh, into uh, uh, parts of present-day Switzerland, uh, but it also uh, created uh, uh, the massacres of beggars and uh, priests in certain areas. And in Sicily, where they had no Jews, they went after the Catalans. But what historians don't tell us and don't seem to have reflected on why only in 1348? We have this recurrence of plague. In some places, uh, already by, six, by 1500, you have 20 or 30 waves of plague. And it is almost unique. There's one case, maybe I shouldn't even, this should be a footnote, but in, uh, in, six, in, in 1361, the second wave of plague, it's the first plague in the region in Poland around Krakow, and there they go after the Jews. Okay, but uh, very few examples. Uh, when this sort of blame raises its ugly head again is in the 16th century. It is at the moment, really, uh, with uh, new notions uh, from uh, Fra Castoro and a host of other people about contagion, about carriers. It's interesting on the local level, not just from doctors, but notaries are starting to uh, examine and become involved in identifying car uh, carriers of different diseases, principally plague. And the leading edge of this new, uh, new uh, ideology, as well as now a new violence against individuals in blame, doesn't come from the ignorant people in the, in the, uh, uh, in the hollows of the Alps, as uh, uh, Yves-Marie Berset uh, once told us. Uh, no, it comes from the highest ex ex echelons of intellectual society. It comes from places like Milan, and, and Milan is perhaps the best example or the one that's certainly been studied the most for these plague spreaders, these people who are blamed and brought to trial for spreading intentionally uh, the plague. Uh, again, it is interesting that even this reemergence of hate since 1348 in a big way 
this reemergence of hate is not like the old one. It's not really blaming the other in any way at all. The people in Milan, and here I've, tra I've tracked down these court records. I know who's on both sides of the fences. I know who, in fact, is making the accusation and who's being accused. And of these trials, what you have, the people making the accusations, for the most part, of course, they are aligned with the authorities, but they are poor women for the most part. Washer women in these communities, uh, and they are the poor. They are the ones making the accusations, and it's, in first instance, solid artisans in the community uh, who are being accused, not outsiders to Milan. It is, uh, it is um, uh, uh, then emerges to being some of the highest people in Milanese society, uh, in the military, uh, and bankers, uh, which might be justifiable, I don't know. Uh, and, but these, this, this sort of people. Okay, I'm probably going on too much. The 19th century is the great period, the great period for the, for the uh, uh, blame uh, disease, the hate disease nexus. It proceeds with cholera, the laboratory revolution, but it is, again, a period of advances in medicine that sees uh, this uh, great emergence of hate and pandemics or epidemics. Cholera is the first. It's the disease that has been studied the most. But even with cholera, it has mainly been studied for its first wave, in uh, first wave at least that spreads through Europe in 1831 to uh, Sicily in 1836. And it is this uh, uh, disease that um, creates, even in the first epidemic in, in, in the British Isles, we can identify uh, over a hundred riots. Some of them are uh, quite serious, involving two or three thousand. There's a claim that in Aberdeen there were fifteen thousand, but I think Aberdeen didn't only had eighteen thousand people, so I don't, I don't think that, that that's quite right. Most of them were around a thousand to two, two thousand. And again, it's, it's the whole notion of the other doesn't work with cholera either, because who are the ones who are like Ebola today. I think the real parallel is cholera. It's not the Black Death, as people wanted me to say. It is cholera. These are the ones who attacked the, uh, the medical corps, nurses, pharmacists, the ones who burnt down uh, these new cholera hospitals, and the, uh, the, the, the wrecks. And who were they? They were mainly the marginals in cities such as Edinburgh. Uh, there was a Catholic population, uh, the, the poorest of people in the population. One I know, uh, which I feel sort of... Uh, uh, in, in, feel interested in because I don't live far about it. It's the cholera hospital. Some of you might know was was right under the castle called the Castle Hospital. And what they did uh, in this uh, uh, riot, one riot in uh, Edinburgh, there were at least two. Uh, they they then uh, grab, they did steal the the. Um, the uh, hearse that's taking people to the hospital, and they wreck it to smithereens and throw it in the canal basin, uh, sort of like that special touch since I go by the canal basin quite a bit. Uh, so uh, this then is uh, this disease, but it keep, this, this epidemic creates this same sort of mythology. Uh, in places such as Italy until 1911, and not just in the south of Italy. Senyi has one of these uh, riots uh, against doctors and, uh, and pharmacists uh, in 1911 in Senyi, which is uh, in Lazio near, near Rome. Uh, and then in Russia and parts of, for instance, Donetsk, which is in the news now. Do, who, do, do you all know that Donetsk was a Welsh town? I mean, you, you know this from the cholera riots. It was formed by this guy Hughes, and called Hughesville in, in 1869, and he built, uh, he was brought in by the Tsar to, uh, for coal and uh, 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 steel works in this town to produce a fleet for, for Russia. Uh, and there's a, a horrific uh, cholera a riot in Donetsk, called then Hughesville, in uh, 1892, in which 10,000 people are involved, in which they completely destroy this town. Uh, one can add many more examples. So there's, there's cholera, but there's also other diseases. And here, uh, for, for instance, in America, and I think that even uh, 
Charles Rosenberg doesn't really get this. The, uh, the, the great disease of hate in America is not really cholera. It creates some riots only in the first uh, uh, wave of cholera in, in 1832, and they are minor in comparison to what's going on at the same time in Europe, from Manchester, uh, Edinburgh, all the way to Asiatic Russia. Uh, but smallpox is the great plague of, of hate. And there, it is a different, it has a different manifestation. Here, for the most part, these riots really are against the victims. They are against the marginals, uh, against tramps, against the, the uh, supposed ignorant bohemian, uh, against blacks, and for the most part, and just vicious, uh, vicious attacks of burning uh, uh, blacks with uh, 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 smallpox and their little makeshift hospitals of uh, lynchings, uh, and then other stories of not quite riots, but similar ones. The papers are filled with these stories. My favorite one, uh, since I'm talking to physicians, is uh, a one about a, a black man in, in Louisa County, uh, Virginia, whose children, he has seven children, they're all dying of smallpox. So when the, he walks through the snow seven miles to the largest town in Louisa, and there people get wind that he's coming, and he is greeted at the town city limits by who else? The physician with a double barrel shotgun telling him to turn around or he's a dead man. Uh, so these things, then there are these plagues, and, and plague, plague, for instance, when it, uh, the, the third pandemic sort in uh, India in particular creates a large number of, uh, of, of very violent uh, riots, which <coughs> seem to have the same configuration of cholera, but which I argue are very different from the cholera, uh, cholera riots. Okay, you have these plagues of hate, but you also have these plagues of compassion. And I hear, I think, the historiography has had very little to say about this, especially in this sort of uh, way of, of the assumption, or at least the impression given, that the normal recourse of big pandemics and epidemics is, in fact, uh, this murder or, or blaming or terrorization of the other of hate. But there are two in particular that I've, I've studied. The first may surprise you, uh, the play is yellow fever. And yellow fever in American history, where uh, most of it is taking place, that at least I have uh, 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 reports on, brings societies together. <laughs> Briefly, in 1853 in New Orleans, a terrible uh, uh, a wave of yellow fever. Um, it's on the eve of the Civil War, and it brings blacks and whites together. Yeah, the blacks, particularly those from West Africa, have a greater immunity to this disease. The white community calls on them to uh, help them uh, in the care of, the, of patients with white doctors dying, and, and they, they come to their aid, and there's a great appreciation from it. It's also a binding period between North and South for this interval because Northerners come down to contribute, risk their lives uh, for during this disease, and contribute money to New Orleans and other places where this disease is spreading. I think it's even more manifest and developed by the time you get to the biggest pandemic of uh, yellow fever in American history in 1878 in the city that was worst hit is Memphis, and it is filled with material of these charitable organizations. Uh, principally, these are organizations, not principally, exclusively. The people who are risking their lives, at least as illustrated in the papers, are men, and I'll get to this later. And it's clubs, it's organizations, some of which rise up because of yellow fever, like the John Howard Association, that travel around treating people, uh, giving uh, food and benefits, uh, employing doctors, mobilizing quite a bit of money in the care of, uh, of the yellow fever stricken. Uh, and then others such as the Odd Fellows and these di different clubs. Um, okay, I'll stop there and get to the topic of this lecture, influenza. And uh, this, uh, again, is considered the, uh, the forgotten uh, disease. Um, I think it's, it was anything but that, and especially in its reportage 
in the U.S. papers, uh, there's no disease that comes near it and the number of pages that one gets from these online uh, newspapers. Uh, the, for 1918 uh, alone, there are uh, over 20, 24,000 uh, results. And on these pages, these large pages, sometimes you have uh, six or seven articles on the ep epidemic. And this is from one database, the Chronicling America uh, database, which is an old one where, in fact, a lot of the a lot of results don't don't come out. Um, and the first thing I'll say, uh, and I won't talk very much about any other epidemic uh, of uh, uh, of influenza, that I have yet to find any uh, any uh, in, a, a wave of influenza or what in the Middle Ages would be called a conquilla or some types of coughing coughing diseases in which people died. Uh, any acts of individual or collective violence. Uh, and uh, the, the Russian influenza, which, uh, yes, was called after the Russians but not blamed on the Russians in 1889-90, and you see this very clearly in the newspaper, there's, uh, there's a, a lot of speculation of what the disease was and why it was so much more virulent than other previous uh, uh, waves of influenza, but no sense of any uh, of this uh, of this type of violence. Now, in the historiography, there is this sense that people really have almost this. It seems to me this this uh, reflex that yes, it's a it's such a big and contagious disease I and mean, contagion. It's so fearful that they had to be. You have to put it in the model. That this model that created by Sander Gilman and others, and, and uh, Susan Sontag, all these uh, these these great scholars uh, and pundits, and John Barry's more popular book, Penguin Book, that's gone through three editions, very much says this was a disease, pretty much a disease of hate. But then you get to his evidence, and about the best he can come up with is that people wore masks, and that in some hick town in Kentucky. Uh, they thought dogs spread the disease, so they shot the dogs. Now, I'm a dog lover, but still, I don't think that's quite the same as murdering doctors in, uh, in Donetsk or other places. Uh, there's just very little for this type of, of disease. There is a conspiracy, and I think this is an example that, uh, that the exception that proves the rule. And it is set off not by the populace, but by at really the highest echelons in America by this uh, lieutenant Colonel Philip Dow Doan, who is the, the head of the U.S. emergency fleet in Washington, who says that prob the reason that this disease is spreading so quickly, it's the, it's the Germans, it's the Huns, and the papers are filled with this, you know, propaganda at this time against the Huns, and it's the Huns coming, sneaking in on U-boats and going into churches and public places of amusement and spreading uh, this, this flu. How they spread it is another matter. It is interesting to see, and here with online newspapers you can see, how just how many newspapers picked it up and for how long. I found five or six, mainly on the East Coast, and for the most part, almost entirely, it is a laughing matter. And then some of you may, may know uh, uh, Catherine, Catherine Ann Porter's uh, pale, pale Horse, Pale Rider, you know, a great story, a great l little novel. And it, if you, it, it goes into this story, and of course the journalists are all joking about it. And you find this type, type of joking of how absurd this story is also in small town newspapers in Wichita and other places in the U.S. It's something I haven't found at all in the British papers. Uh, I found one notice of it in the Australian papers. I found no notice of it closer to home in places like Italy or, or France. Um, okay, now for compassion. And I think this sense of compassion of this great disease has already been highlighted by two great books, two great books that came out about the same time. Already, uh, uh, first, uh, there was uh, uh, Richard Collier's book called The, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, Spanish, the Disease of the Spanish Lady. 
uh, which has uh, it's a it's a remarkable book. Some of you may know it. It's it, I think much more could be done with his data. He has uh, 1,706 interviews of people all over the world, mainly in Europe and in the U.S., but in other places as well. And you see, you see this, this sense of compassion. And then Alfred Crosby's much more famous book, uh, which is the, uh, the forgotten, uh, the great forgotten pandemic of 1976. Uh, curiously, Crosby never cited uh, Collier so it wasn't so forgotten as he thought. Maybe he just didn't know, but this book had come out two years earlier. And just to look at Crosby, he particularly he has this cameo piece of Philadelphia, of elite volunteers entering city ghettos, uh, the open kitchens, uh, uh, feed the poor, cab drivers, uh, mobilizing 2,000 organizations that cut across denominational lines. Uh, and he has about... Catholic nuns, curiously, he says very little about women, which I think is, is very curious once you start reading the papers. And the same can go for Collier. He says very little about women, even though I think I counted once that most of his uh, respondents, most of the people he interviewed were, were women. And here you get a much more international picture. Probably the most famous one is the Australians, the Australian soldiers uh, risking their necks. It was never uh, that so deadly a disease in Aust Australia, mainly because of their internal quarantines and perhaps for other reasons, the lethality rates are much lower in Australia than any other any other country that I know of that I've calculated. But they go to West Samoa, which must have had the highest uh, rates of lethality and the highest overall mortality rates. I mean, they can compete with the Eskimos and the, and the Inuits in, the, in Canada, but somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the population is wiped out by this disease. And yet they volunteer. It's volunteer and they go there to assist these people. Um, one can add to this, and I've found n numerous examples. One is to, to get the Federated Jewish Charities of Boston or in, in Washington, uh, it's a place where the medical students all volunteered the fourth year, and the second year students wanted to volunteer the second and third, but they weren't allowed, but they did other work instead. And so you get this uh, uh, male picture, and in some places I'm sure that this was, uh, it was very much like, like yellow fever, a male response. This compassion was centered on, male, uh, on, on a male organization. At New Orleans, uh, you don't hear much about women, but about the Elks Club. And I wonder if this is really the tradition of, uh, of yellow fever. And they, uh, there's this massive dispensary uh, of the Elks Club, apparently then had, was filled with pharmacists and physicians. They give up their time. It has these stories. Uh, and in fact, it's filled with uh, these statistics of how many, the, in the first uh, the, the thousands of eggs, crackers, oranges, and, and hundreds of loaves of breads and gallons of milk. But again, in the first three days, uh, they filled uh, a thousand free prescriptions. Its physician had had made over 498 house calls. Calls, and then within two weeks, they had made 11,228 house calls and 13,000. 440 prescriptions, and then they uh, ultimately it's over 15,000 house calls. Uh, and they did things like they uh, refurbished the banquet room of the Charles, of the, uh, the Charles uh, uh, Hotel to make sure that doctors had a place to sleep for these emergency calls. They talk about doctors working solid out, flat out for 38 hours. Uh, it is it's this type of, of climate, and then also in New Orleans, you see other male organizations getting in to this charitable act, like the fourth year. Medical students at Tulane are, are called upon by the Elks Club at one point to join them, to help them out. You get this, these, the, the dentists sign an agreement with the Board of Health saying that they will uh, stop doing any dental work to address the emergency and will work any time of day. You get the very exclusive yacht club on Lake Pontchartrain uh, setting up out of their, their luxurious clubhouse at Convalescent Hospital. 
And then there's a group that I have heard of nothing like it anywhere else, the Knights of the Grip. You know, it's called Grip in, in, in French. And these were traveling salesmen who were locked into New Orleans for some reason, and they post that they will go in and, and look after the, the ill at any time of night. They put up advertisements in the major newspaper, the Times Picayune. I'm available between 10 o'clock uh, at night to 3 in the morning. Uh, and these, it's this very male dominated response. These are very much the exceptions. And here you sort of wonder once you read three or four uh, East Coast newspapers already, you see, wait a minute, something very remarkable in the history of, of, of uh, this type of compassion and charity is happening that you, I don't see in previous uh, epidemics. And this is the role of women. And there may be a lot of good reasons for this. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll appreciate your uh, interventions. Um, here, on the first, and, and this is, and here I apologize because I really should have more illustrations. And that's my, because what, what is happening right now in, in, in journalism, at least in America, is photojournalism. And it comes to the aid of celebrating these acts of compassion, and particularly by women. You have on the first, the, the debutantes and the ladies, the Mrs. Hoover, who then becomes the, the first lady as the, 31st, as, a, as the wife of the 31st uh, president of the United States. Mrs. Gore, who is, must be the grandmother, it could be the great-grandmother, but I think the grandmother of, of, uh, uh, of our own Gore in our own times. He comes from a very uh, elite senatorial family. Uh, Mrs. Lansing, whose husband is a secretary of state. Mrs. McAdoo, whose uh, husband is a very powerful uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury. And here's something, too, that's rather curious. She is always identified as Mrs. McAdoo, uh, and not by a maiden name, which strikes me as rather curious, because she also had another distinction. She was the daughter of Woodrow Wilson, who was the, damn, who was the president at that time. At any rate, these people feature, and of course, they give their automobiles, and they're publicized, and uh, and this photojournalism, uh, and they, they may do a little more, but this is not what you would think. This is not what you would think even from the perspective of 1916. In 1916, there was a polio epidemic, and yes, there was a women's group, a women's group involved in this called the, uh, do I have it up there, the, the Mother's uh, Militia to Fight Paralysis and Help Your Neighbors. And these were elite women who didn't dirty their hands in the slightest. They lectured uh, to, uh, actually, not even to these women, but to others who were to go out and patrol these women and blame the disease on dirty Italians and on other dirty, irresponsible mothers of the poor in the, in the uh, tenements of New York. Uh, and they went around preaching that this is what they had to do to keep their babies uh, right and that to keep things straight. They were the reason why these babies were having polio. And they even went out patrolling with the police to arrest these mothers who weren't keeping their houses tidy. Uh, there's nothing that smacks of this anywhere, in anywhere in America that I've seen or in any other country, even by these elites. There's a second level to this with this photojournalism that I, I think is exciting with very long articles, five or six columns, about uh, a, a different cut, a middle class cut of women who are, have just graduated from uh, universities. Uh, how much time, time do I have? Uh, okay, good. Uh, who, um, and who um, um, do these these sort of remarkable things. They organize these motorcades. They are part of this new generation of women who drive and own their automobiles. And in uh, places such as Washington, Philadelphia, New York, they, uh, they, they go around picking up the, uh, the afflicted and, and putting them in their cars. They go up, they have stories of them climbing the stairs of these uh, at, at one and two in the morning to get these 200-pound men. They bring up the stretchers 
uh, and uh, they can't get down these narrow uh, tenement uh, stairwells. So these women put 200 pound men on their backs and bring them down to the cars and speed around. And it is this, this chatter, of, like this one woman from California who's in Hoboken organizing this group. She's in her 20s and she says, yeah, mass, they ask her about mass. We don't bother with it. Hey, if we get the disease, we get the disease. I came down with it for three days. All right, I'm over it now. I'm back on the job. This is what they did. It's sure that this, this, this is zeal. The question I have is what, what really happens to these women after uh, uh, 1919? What do they do? Uh, what, what's, what are they doing in the Roaring Twenties? But I'll just cut short. And I'd, I'd like to read this one because, I, you know, when you look at all this newsprint, sometimes there's these stories that really... Uh, get to you, maybe maybe it won't be translated, but one is in Washington, there was one of these motorcades and a, I'll just, a, a doctor found a girl suffering with Spanish influenza in a rooming house, three flights up, homeless, as war workers are in this city of magnificent distances and prices and I don't know if any I can't find anything written on these women war workers, uh, a fascinating group of really intellectual proletariat who are some of the most impoverished people in Washington at this time exploited uh, and yet they read and write as stenographers uh, and it gets to it in, th in this and they also contribute they volunteer after long hours of working in the Pentagon and other places they come out and they uh, was the Pentagon even existence then well in war offices and they come out and they uh, they they take care of of the the uh, uh, the, the stricken. Uh, any rate, the, the, uh, he telephoned to the garage of the American Red Cross Motor Corps, and in a few minutes, an ambulance driven by one of us drove to the door. The driver, that's the person being interviewed, but he doesn't even talk about herself in the first person, ascended the stairs with a woman stretcher barrier, and after the patient had been placed on a stretcher, an attempt was made to carry her down. The twisting, winding stairway prevented this, and so the driver that is the woman, uh, took the sufferer on her back and carried her down uh, stairs into the ambulance. And then another, a couple of weeks later, in less than a, a, an hour, a uniformed girl ambulance driver stood on one side of the cot, her soldier orderly on the other. And here in these photographs, there are ones of these, these women and their male orderlies, and nothing is said about the male orderlies. No praise, nothing. The young girl ambulance driver who a few months ago uh, knew little about life except the foxtrot and the smartest angle at which to wear a new hat held up one end of the stretcher. A moment later, the same girl was driving the clanging ambulance to the newly opened influenza hospital at Virginia Avenue. That case and the girl is typical of the endemic, right now raging in the city, typical of the shameful housing conditions of women war workers, typical of the heroic service being uh, given by the Red Cross, uh, etc. And it keeps on going on about uh, these, these women and uh, uh, how they work these extraordinary long shifts this, uh, and this sort of uh, this, this courage. Now, what you also get in the newspapers, what one uh, headline called the thousands of deeds of, of, of heroism. Um, and here, what is the, the people who are praised over and over again are uh, those who are nursing, those who are, are nursing students who then uh, volunteer, and many of them die in, in, in close quarters with the afflicted. Uh, some of them die, it is said, because of overexhaustion, then combined with flu, of working 24, 30 hours in a row and, and refusing to not work. Uh, even when the doctor says, please go home, they don't. Uh, and that, that's also the great in a sense, liberation of those in education because of the closing of schools uh, and uh, teachers freed up from work as well as students. Uh, this photojournalism also, in a few cases, descends further down and again concentrates on women. For instance, as one in the Boston Globe, a fine work done by the Alst Alston Canteen. And those of you who know 
Boston geography, even today, Alston is a pretty impoverished, very Catholic uh, community. And here was these women who were working, who set up this canteen to feed, and it again gives the statistics of how many gallons of milk they distributed over three or four weeks. And another one in Kansas City of ladies of the auxiliary school of nurse assistants, and this was a black college as, as associated with a hospital and the blacks it, what, what should have been their vacation after graduation, they all in mass volunteer to serve in these hospitals throughout, uh, throughout the state of Can states of Kansas and Missouri. And I think the most uh, uh, striking case is really, and I'll come maybe if there's time, come back to it, is El Paso. Uh, El Paso, again, because of, well, a number of reasons, and I don't know anyone who's even talked about El Paso and influenza, but the women there convert the nerve center of El, El Paso for taking care largely of the Mexican uh, population, the impoverished Mexican population, or women, or school, uh, uh, school girls, and then the, pr the principal of this high school, okay, middle class, but certainly not a Mac McAdoo, uh, it organizes this. And you find it also in the West and other cities uh, like Carlsbad, New Mexico, again, where white Anglo-Saxon women cross the lines, cross the borders to tend to the stricken Mexican population. In Ogden, Utah, uh, the school superintendent is the head of this uh, 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 charity, Sumter, South Carolina, so it's not, there are these places where it's the girls' high school. Uh, Winslow, Arizona, with uh, the girls from the domestic science class. All through this, it's curious. Well, where are the boys? They're not talking about boys. Uh, mention here and there Boy Scouts as messengers, but they're hardly there. And the same even with the fourth-year students of Tulane. When they get to the universities, it is girls' universities, women's universities, Bryn Mawr, Vassar, uh, uh, where there's this large core of women coming into New York City uh, to, to uh, risk their lives in nursing or in doing other sweeping floors, taking care of the, uh, of the stricken in the t in tenements of Hoboken and these other places. And these, these are, 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 they are dirtying their hands. They are doing these, these uh, tasks of tending to children for mothers who are either dead, have died, uh, this large surplus of orphans given the age structure of this disease. Uh, and uh, uh, at the University of Missouri, which is a co-ed university, it's the it's it's nurses, it's other it's women students who become uh, the 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 telephone girls who who make sputum cups, who drive automobiles, who give their automobiles. And Boston is really the curious one. With 80 colleges and university, where is Harvard? Where is Boston College? Where is Boston University? No mention of them. The one school that really gets the limelight that you hear about is Simmons College, the girls', you know, the girls college, elite girls college uh, in Boston. When I go to the US in February, I'm going to just creep into the Harvard archives and just see if there's anything there. It's not in the papers. They are not, certainly not advertising anything that any Harvard boys did. Um, okay, in the remaining time, and I realize I haven't, I haven't gone fast enough, I've delayed too much, I want to talk about disease and context and get at this uh, problem of why influenza is so different why, why, uh, in general and why this, this difference in 1918, 1919. First, going back to that model that I started with, uh, a mysterious disease. Well, sometimes people would say, well, influenza is so familiar. Well, as most of you know, in 1918, this was not a familiar disease. This was a disease that was mysterious and caused a lot of consternation among the, the, medical, the medical core. The age profile is very different, attacking those in the best, in the, in the strongest years from 20 to 30, and then after that to 40, uh, not st striking the weak uh, at both ends of the age structure. Uh, and the signs uh, and, and symptoms were different. This, as in the, the, the uh, book you showed me with the color plates, it's turned faces view blue. It's the same sort of oxygen depletion that one finds with cholera, uh, uh, with these people being, being uh, uh, starved of oxygen and also really drowning in their own, uh, uh, in the, the, the waters of their collapsing lungs, this suffocation and this, this sponge-like pink 
lungs that come out in different ways and even in some forms of septicemia. Uh, and the most prominent physician in America at that time, William Henry Welsh, and amongst a lot of others, questioned what was this disease. In Europe, many thought that this was plague. It was pneumonic plague. There's this real sense of what it was. Okay, context, the war. The war, the great explanation, you know, the, here are these women, it's just true, you can see it in diaries, these women who are jealous in sense of their younger brothers because they've got to go to the front and become heroes. There was nothing left for them, so 1918 is a great chance for them to become heroines, and they do. Uh, but I think the war splits much more than it brings society together, World War I. And, uh, and just a thumbnail sketch in America, 1918-1920, uh, these terrorist bombings, the cries of Bolsheviks, uh, the, uh, the, the, the hysterical Red Scare that ultimately blows up with the Sacco Vanzetti trials. You have the worst general strikes, I think, in, in, uh, in American history. At Seattle, you have the famous Boston uh, police strike where the uh, Brahmins and the Harvard students go out and, and break the strike and beat up the strikers, uh, this type of real class conflict. Uh, in Winnipeg, it is this so general strike, strike in Winnipeg across the border in Canada is proclaimed to be the worst labor dispute in Canadian history. They're the worst race riots in American history, hands down. In 1917, uh, East St. Louis, it's a, a race riot that continues uh, on for almost a year, off and on. Chicago, almost the same thing in 1919. In Tulsa, this uh, destruction by 1921 of 4,000 homes and 400 blacks are killed. Uh, and, and a fairly, uh, the whole black community suburb of Greenwood is wiped out. Uh, El Paso is a case in point. Here the context is going in just the opposite direction. Not only do you have the war and hyped up nationalism, you have a double war in places on the, on the Texas border, and it has to do with the, Amer the uh, Mexican Revolution, which is also a civil war. You have the U.S. occupation of Veracruz. You have Pancho Villa's raid on, on Columbus in, across the border into to New Mexico. And then the massacre, Pancho Villa's massacre at Santa Isabel, where uh, it, 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 16 Americans are killed, and it triggers the first what is called genuine race riot in, uh, in uh, the first genuine race riot in El Paso's history. And along this with the great rise of the Ku Klux Klan. And against this, what do you have? You have middle class and uh, uh, women crossing the lines for the first time, going into the ghettos of Mexicans, really risking their lives to take care of the uh, underprivileged and of these people with this terrifying contagion. The last bit, and then I don't have time to really talk about this, is the micro context created by the great influ influenza. The, I think, and I don't think that any uh, uh, American historian has said this, and I, that this more than the Puritans, more than uh, with uh, um, uh, any other period of the Red Scare or any of the McCarthy period, this is the great period of surveillance into private, uh, of private lives and, and incursions on personal liberties. Uh, with all of these closures of mountains and uh, this internal quarantines, but also the propaganda that's uh, unleashed by this against coffers, sneezers, big, and even Boston big talkers, so that there were ordinances passed in small towns and other places where you could, uh, you could be fined, and in some cases up to massive amounts of, of five, $500, which was a lot of money back then, uh, for uh, spitting on the floor or something, and, and the propaganda in the papers and in the medical uh, handouts uh, and placards are to avoid the sick at all costs, avoid anyone who sneezes. And, 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 and one poster, and here I'll get to this one, is, uh, you know, let's take what we, uh, our, our tankmen, the roughest guys in the army, and let's, uh, let's uh, uh, treat them, treat them rough. It's almost saying that if you see a coffer in the subway in New York, you should beat the guy up if, or, or certainly run. 
and yet no examples, no examples whatsoever of collective violence against these people or even incidences of, of, of individual violence. Uh, and then with kissing. K kissing becomes an ordinance in many places against kissing. And I like the one from the placard at the University of, 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 Miz uh, of Missouri. Kissing is criminal. Now it is time for university women to be unsociable. But then they were sociable to the point of death, of risking their lives. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you. <laughs>